today we have my good friend and client Larry Johnson, who is the CEO of Veris Consulting. And Larry, welcome to the show. Thanks for being a special guest today. Thanks for having me. It's always a pleasure. No problem. Um, you know, we're going to delve into your background a little bit. I'd like to hear you know a little bit about where you came from, where you grew up, and also uh, a little bit about Veris and uh, about what you're doing uh, today. Uh, tell me a little bit about yourself. Where did you grow up? I was uh, born actually in Washington, D.C., so I'm like a sixth-generation native Washingtonian. I grew up in uh, the uh, close-in suburbs in Maryland uh, in a little town called Mount Rainier. Uh, went to the local Catholic school for eight years. The nuns put up with me for eight years. Uh, <laughs> then I thought I was a basketball player, so I went to uh, – high school named DeMatha High School, which has been the producer of a bunch of NBA talent. And Adrian although I made Danley. the freshman year, I realized I was a, you know, as the, the movie said, white men can't jump. I was the epitome of that. So <laughs> uh, my basketball career ended uh, somewhat abruptly. Uh, and then I transferred, went to uh, public high school, uh, then the University of Maryland, uh, and began my professional career after I graduated from the University of Maryland. And uh, you're a CPA, correct? Correct, yes. So um, I remember you telling me that you were uh, with a firm called Ernst & Winnie. Yes. What was that? Uh, well, at uh, the time I graduated, which was uh, way too many years ago, 1968, there were what was referred to as the Big Eight. They were eight national, international CPA firms, which really kind of dominated the landscape of accounting firms, Ernst, it, at that time it was Ernst and Ernst. Uh, it right. was one of those right. big eight firms. Uh, you know, I interviewed with all eight of them. You know, I've, I've received, you know, a bunch of offers and then negotiated my salary. So I, I was able to up my starting salary from 9000 to $9,300, <laughs> uh, which I thought was all the money in the world. Uh, and I began my career in its Washington, D.C. office. Uh, and I spent the next uh, 18 years with that firm in that office. I was admitted to the partnership uh, in 1978. No, yeah, I'd been with the firm 10 years when I was admitted to the partnership. And I remained a partner for eight years. Six of those I was in charge of the kind of the audit, audit and accounting practice for that firm. And uh, I resigned from the partnership in 1986. You know, I, the the intimacy of being one of 2,000 partners kind of left me a little bit cold. And wow. I was about to turn 40 and thought that I ought to try to see whether I was as good as entrepreneur as I thought I was. So I so I quit uh, and started uh, my own practice, which was named Johnson Lambert and Company. Uh, we put company on it to make it sound like there were more people than Johnson and Lambert, but it was two people um, with, you know, some ridiculous ambitions. Um, but I thought, it, if not then, never. Um, and so I did that. And, you know, at the time, I thought that, um, you know, that firm could be kind of a niche specialty boutique kind of firm working with things that were in my background, which were financial institutions, insurance companies and the like. And you know, kind of had some audacious goals, but today, uh, and I, I, rem I remain with that firm as the managing partner until 2005. Uh, today, that firm is, uh, I think, in eight offices, has better than 150 professionals. The big eight has shrunk to the big four uh, through either merger or, in the case of Arthur Anderson, its demise. Where I started uh, my Johnson career. Yeah, I mean, Johnson Lambert now, in terms of, of – CPA firm serving the insurance uh, marketplace in the U.S. is the fifth largest firm. So some of those um, aspirations actually became reality. Uh, over time, uh, I dabbled more by happenstance doing a little bit of expert witness work, and uh, that became something that was uh, I was more involved with and frankly had more of an interest in. Uh, and that bit practice began to sort of develop on its own. So in the year 2000, uh, I, I concluded that that was really a separate type of service and 
separated that from Johnson Lambert into a firm named Veris Consulting, which is where I've spent the last 21 years. Um, for five of those years, I continued to be the managing partner of Johnson Lambert as well, and then I officially retired from Johnson Lambert in 2005 um, and have continued to be the CEO of Veris Consulting up, up until our acquisition, with which I know you're very familiar, um, a couple of months ago. Yeah, I'm very familiar with Johnson Lambert, too, because I was helpful, I guess, in helping you uh, separate the businesses and let them both thrive uh, many years ago. But uh, it's, yes. it was an interesting time. I remember meeting you for the first time probably about 16 years ago. Um, the uh, How would you describe yourself in your earlier years? You know, you, you Tell me about the basketball thing, because I'm fascinated by that. <laughs> Were you a center? Well... <laughs> yeah, yeah, I was a hot shot guard. I thought, uh, right. you know, when I was, uh, you know, when I was growing up, and you know, the the sports were. In, if you went to Catholic school, they were conducted by the Catholic youth organization CYO, and mm -hmm. you know, I was, you know, I played basketball, baseball, football. I thought I was, you know, the all around all American athlete, um, and uh, and and actually, probably in retrospect, was pretty good. Uh, you know, I went, I went, I was a bit recruited because back then the Catholic schools, uh, high schools began to do some recruiting. Um, but I never will forget, I, in the summer between, you know, my graduation eighth grade from St. James Catholic School to DeMatha, you know, they had, you know, kind of summer practice where the new kids came out. And I remember going to this and, you know, I was probably, you know, five foot seven. Uh, and there were three kids that could dunk the ball. They were six eight, six nine. Ultimately, three of them became high school Americans. Two of them played in the NBA. And I quickly realized that it was a different world, uh, and that I should really think about other career opportunities. <laughs> Why did you go into accounting? Uh, it, happenstance. I uh, I went to University of Maryland with uh, this idea of uh, becoming an attorney. So I was quote unquote pre-law, uh, which meant you were in at Maryland you know, at the College of Arts and Sciences and you had to have a foreign language requirement. And uh, I started in that first semester and I looked at what the curriculum was and said, I, I don't wanna do that. So I transferred to the business school and in my, I guess, sophomore year, you know, you take the principles of accounting and I had no idea really what it was. And, you know, all my friends were really struggling with these, you know, debits on the left, credits on the right, and everything had to balance. Yeah. And it just came really easy to me. So I thought, well, maybe I'll take a few more. And I took a few more and it continued to come kind of easy. And then I started hearing that you could actually get a job doing it. And, you know, p people were making what I thought was just great amounts of money, you know, 80 300 bucks, I think, the class ahead of me. So I continued that and, you know, I, I, I graduated, uh, you know, I was in the accounting honorary thing and I was a, you know, magna cum laude graduate, but it was, you know, the accounting thing was really um, simply because it seemed to come easy. It seemed to make sense. I don't know whether it's you know, I think I have a somewhat analytical mind. People say you, you're accountant because you were good at math, right? And I said, I don't know that I was good at math at all. It's, it has nothing to do with math. Uh, it just, uh, it all kind of clicked. And, you know, as the expression goes, the you know, rest is history. I, you know, I, I did very well. I was, you know, those big eight firms, you know, they recruited heavily, you know, lunches and dinners and all that stuff. And, you know, I was, uh, I was, had became, my ego continued to grow. Uh, with each passing lunch, and I thought this is really pretty cool. Um, so I, you know, I, I started, I started at Ernst and Ernst, and I frankly had no uh, expectation of continuing long term. I, I looked around, I saw there was a pretty high turnover rate. So I, you know, I enrolled in graduate school uh, at GW and uh, toured a, a, a master's with a concentration in finance because I thought I was ultimately going to leave and that just be one more credential. But then I continued to advance. I was going to graduate school at night. And, uh, you know, I, I, I got to a point, I, I think I completed all my course credits. I needed to write a thesis. Uh, and it became a question of, 
you know, I was doing well where I was. I was enjoying it more. Uh, I wanted to write the great American novel as a thesis, and I never got to that. So I simply just gave it up and said, looks like I'm in this for, the, for life. And that's how I've been treating things for the last 40 years. So, Varys, you mentioned that you sort of started dabbling in expert witness testimony, but um, Varys is a forensic accounting firm, right? Correct, yes. What is forensic accounting, for those who don't know? I, th I think it's uh, trying to look at um, e economics and uh, uh, identify causes and implications of various kinds of either events or transactions, uh, including circumstances where there's been apparent uh, wrongdoing or where there is are instances of, of potential fraud or insolvency to try to uh, put the pieces together and figure out why and who and how, um, and in certain circumstances to identify instances of wrongdoing, certain instances identify wrongdoers, mm -hmm. in some instances identifying the economic harm resulting from that. Um, you know, some of our engagements, I mean, we've been very fortunate to have been involved in some very high profile matters uh, where we spent a significant amount of time in very complex things, which would included, you know, Enron, um, uh, really? the Bernie wow. Madoff things, Lehman Brothers, um, and you know, in, in terms of the insurance world, I think if you were to look at probably the lar 10 largest insolvencies in U.S. history, um, we've been involved doing forensic work along the lines I described in probably half of them. So I think for a relatively small organization, we, we developed a reputation for being able to figure out particularly complex things and be able to describe them in a way that was understandable, um, whether that was through reports or deposition or trial testimony. Mm -hmm. Um, and uh, it's been it's been really a very uh, in, enjoyable and successful run. So you got to live out your dream of being an attorney because you were working with attorneys all the time, probably smarter than half of yeah, them. Yeah, it was. It's, you know, I always want I always want to sit on the other side to be the one asking the questions. Um, but 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 frankly, I think that uh, uh, the the thing that I have enjoyed most, and it, it's you know, you got you, you got to be a little bit uh, not right in the head. But, um, you know, I, I enjoy cross-examination because I believe that's really a test of, of wits and a test of knowledge and the ability to think fast and to figure things out. Um, and so to me, you know, it, you know when, you do, when, you, when you do testimony, the direct examination is, you know, it's kind of like putting on a production. You know, it's your kind of questions and answers that are based upon their findings and your report and crosses where the other side is trying to pick that apart. Right. And to me, that's the part where the juice has really begun to flow. And because it really is then a test of, you know, how well you've developed your findings, how good you are at expressing them, how rational your thinking is and how well you can defend it. Why did you, uh, why did you sell the business? What led you to sell the business? I think there was, you know, first of all, it was not an easy decision to come to. You know, when you when you give birth to something and then you watch it grow, uh, it's, you know, a little bit like your kid going off to college and you try to figure out what to do. I, I, I think there were a couple of reasons. Uh, you know, one is, is you know, my age. I, 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 I'm certainly not as young as I was when we started all these things. Um, and, and I think it was the ability to introduce additional capital to permit um, not, not just the continuation of the business, but um, future growth. Um, because in a small firm, you know, there's always a constraint of capital. And if you're going to expand, whether it's organically or not, it requires capital. And yes. the, the a transaction in which it looked like to me there was an opportunity for capital in amounts that were beyond our reach made a great deal of sense. Um, you know, it, the, the firm with which we've merged uh, has some similar uh, attributes, similar culture, um, and similar services. Um, there's a substantial private equity firm behind it. So I think it it's just seemed to make sense. The timing seemed to be right. You know, I had 
explored uh, possibilities in the past, and they just never seem to be right, either because of economics or culture or um, capital or all the things that, when I looked at the particular transaction that we actually entered into, all seemed to make sense. What was the greatest obstacle that you faced in your career that you had to overcome, and how did you manage to overcome it? I think the demands that a successful career places on your personal life. Uh, you know, I think that uh, I find I think it was it's very difficult. I think it's probably more true 40 years ago than it is today. Um, you know, when, when I when I started, uh, you know, there was a busy season, and you worked six or seven days a week, yeah. and you worked 10 or 12 hours a day, and you did that from January to maybe April. Um, you know, you you. What, you know, it, 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 it was such a different world, you know, you went out to lunch, then you went out to dinner and then you went back to work after dinner um, and you'd get home and then you started all over the next day and, and having a personal life and, you know, um, you know, wife and kids and trying to balance that uh, is very, very difficult. I do think today, um, you know, the kids today, it's different. And I think the work ethic has changed, not that they're less interested in work, but I think the world has recognized that you, there's got to be a better balance of, of life, personal yeah. priorities as well as business goals. And um, back then, I don't think they really existed. You you were either in or you were out. Uh, yeah. You know, you couldn't say, I want to I go home tonight and spend the evening with the kids or the family or something. That was, that's just what, you, you didn't talk about it. Um, you know, I thought I was a big trend breaker when, you know, I didn't wear a hat to work. I mean, that was, <laughs> that just tells you how... You know, I'm going out with these people that, you know, they got three-piece suits and hats. And, you know, if I had my druthers, I'd have had, you know, shorts and, you know, flip-flops on. But, um, and sweatshirts you know, and I, I do, I, I, you know, I think that uh, I, I paid, and my family and dad, like, paid a price for that. And, yeah. you know, you, you make choices and sometimes you look back and say, maybe I, I should have done something different. But, you know, I had a, I had a, I had a, I was frankly, I was pretty much driven and I had a passion and I wanted to, uh, you know, I'm, I'm first generation college. Uh, I grew up in what probably today would be referred to as the hood. Uh, I didn't know it was the hood. It was just where I lived. And, you know, I, I, I had a, um, I had a mindset that I was going to do something different. I was going to, you know, I was going to be whatever the hell successful meant, which back then I think kind of meant uh, you made more money and you had some type of professional status. And yep. that kind of drove me. Well, I, uh, I we, we've run out of time for today, but I'm going to have you back on the show uh, at another time because I want to talk about your other passion, which is horse racing. And um, and it's something that, that you're deeply involved in. And it's a whole nother business, a whole nother, uh, it's, I wouldn't call it a hobby. It's a whole nother business that I, uh, I want to explore with you. We'll schedule you in the future, but uh, I really appreciate your time today. Your story is compelling, and it's you know what what it illustrates to me is that uh, entrepreneurs have a passion. You're an entrepreneur. You had a passion. You pursued it, and uh, you successfully achieved uh, an exit for your business. But uh, you did it in a way that uh, re really preserved the culture of what you had you know strived so hard to build and so i congratulate you on that well th thank you and i you know you i know you you know that i'm appreciative of the help you gave along the way to make that transaction happen uh you know i felt at times we were in the 13 month of a nine month pregnancy but uh <laughs> it's all done i I, uh, I would love to talk to you about the horse racing because that really is that's a different kind of passion um it's a different kind of thrill uh, and it's something that really uh, is the, the, you get an adrenaline high and, um, you know, and you don't have to worry about staff retention because the horses don't need personal time off. <laughs> well, with that, we'll, we'll say thank you. And, uh, and uh, Larry, have a great weekend. Um, again, it's great seeing you and uh, look forward to talking to you about the horse racing in the future. Look forward to it. You enjoy the weekend as well. Thanks thank as you. always, man. You've been listening to Blueprint for Wealth, and uh, we thank Larry Johnson, uh, formerly of Veris Consulting, uh, and now of Larry Johnson's horse racing, racing uh, enterprise. We're going to talk about that in the future. Thank you again, and have
Have a great uh, have a great day. Thanks for listening to Blueprint for Wealth, a video cast that hopefully is helping you realize your personal dreams of wealth and freedom. For more information on these topics and more, visit us on the web at zellaw.com or give us a call at 571-203-ZELL or 571-203-9355. I'm Wayne Zell. Have a great day. <music>